grace to give an invitation. And that is by the power of the Holy Spirit to take the Word of God and break us to it down at the feet of Christ. And they will hear the voice of the Son of God and follow Him. It may be the priest, it may be the king and queen, it may be the one man at midnight, it may be multitudes in the marketplace. It shall not return unto me, Lord, but it shall accomplish that which I please. Well, hey, everyone. It's good to see you. I'm glad to be back with you. I missed you. Um, I've, I've been out for the past three weeks, family vacation, officiating a couple of weddings, but I'm glad to be here this morning. I want to say thanks to Pastor John Guest and Pastor Mike Arnold and also Bob Cummings and Nate Glover for their incredible preaching during the past three weeks. I'm really grateful to have faithful guys to come up here and stand and share the word. And I got to tell you, you know, I've, I've worshiped in a couple different places while I've been gone, and they've been wonderful experiences. But it only made me realize, once again, how grateful I am to be a part of the family at Christ Church at Grove Farm. I'm so grateful that God has called me to serve as a pastor in this congregation. And I want you to know that, like, you know, what is it, that the distance makes the heart grow fonder? That's how I feel about you. I love you all. And I'm so grateful to be back here today. So, um, yeah, I'm excited to share today from Acts chapter 12. As we get into the Word, why don't we turn to the Lord once more in prayer? at least once more, and let's get into the word as we turn to the Lord and ask him to speak to our hearts. Father, thank you that we are a family through Jesus Christ, and thank you for the sense of warmth and belonging we have here, Lord. We're grateful. I pray that every person would really feel that, and we're thankful, Lord, that all this comes to us through our Savior, Jesus Christ, the one we proclaimed in song and in creed, the one we prayed to. And what a privilege it is, Lord, to be a part of your family. God, um, we're grateful for what you're doing in the church family, in the church uh, beyond our little spot here on Mount Nebo Road. We pray, God, that your work would advance for your glory. We pray, God, that your work in us would advance for your glory. And so now as we look at your word, I pray, God, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would transform us. Come, Holy Spirit. Teach us, challenge us, grow us, and do all of this by the power of the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray in his name, amen. So looking ahead, uh, 2024 is once again going to be a presidential election year. And whenever I say that, like you see some people put their heads down, you know, you, you kind of feel a sense of tension rise in the room. And I guess justifiably so, right? That, it, it's not a pleasant uh, prospect these days to think about that. And it does cause us some tension. But, but certainly, we are going to be people who are very much interested to see what happens during the course of the year in 2024. We're absolutely interested in that because we, we love this country, because we love future generations, You know, those that we're connected to, our kids, our grandkids, for some of us, great-grandkids, we're absolutely invested, right? And because we love the gospel, and our desire to see the gospel continue to flourish. There is a danger that we have to speak of whenever we think about the election and and what is going on in our own hearts and and, and the challenges that we might face as a nation. And, And the question is this, do you fear political powers Or do you trust in the timing of God? This is an important question. Because as we do look to the election, you know, there there are some hopes and aspirations that will arise in each of us. There's a tendency in the human heart, and this is true throughout the course of history, not just for present day people. But the human heart, it's human nature to look for political deliverers. Someone that can help make life better for us. Someone that will give us a better situation. We see this even in the book of Acts, at the outset of the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 1. They're looking for someone to deliver them politically. And the human heart is, is prone to look for political deliverers, someone who will make things right, or someone who won't screw everything up. And so once again, I'm going to put that question back up there. This is important. I want you to think about this deeply. Do you 
fear political powers. I mean, deep down, does that make you anxious? Does fear, like, grip you? Or do you simply trust in God's timing, His purposes, that He is working in this world? The text that we're looking at that Jeremiah has already read for us, I believe, speaks to this in a really powerful way. And what we're going to see here is this, is that nothing can stop the gospel. So let's, let's turn to this text. I pray that God will speak to us through it. Um, let's pick back up in verse 18. Here's what I, I believe you will see here in this. You're going to see pandemonium. We'll talk about that. You're going to see power, demonstration of power. And you're also going to see pain. we got some P words today. Pandemonium, power and pain. Let's look first at the pandemonium. Here's the setting. If you weren't with us last week, we're at the beginning of Acts chapter 12. Nate Glover during this service uh, preached a wonderful message for us. And in Acts 12, James, follower of Jesus, is murdered by Herod. And then Herod turns on Peter. And he imprisons Peter. And you can bet your life that his intent was to also murder Peter. This is all a political game, by the way. It's an official of Rome trying to appease the Jewish leadership who were threatened by the Christians. And so he's seeking to take out the church. But of course, as you know, Peter was miraculously set free. And where we pick up today is right on the heels of Peter's miraculous escape from prison. Check this out, verse 18. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for Peter and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. Okay, so Herod. As Pastor John mentioned at 9 o'clock last week, this is not the same Herod that you read about um, at the birth of Jesus. This is his grandson. And he probably learned some things from his tyrannical grandfather because this Herod uh, was an anti-supernaturalist. He did not believe in the supernatural. And so when he hears about Peter being delivered, escaping from prison, he wouldn't believe. That, that Peter's deliverance was from God's hand, that God had done something miraculous. No, he was looking for a natural explanation as to what happened. So he brings in the prison guards, and he puts them to death. By the way, it was 16 of them. If you remember at the beginning of Acts 12, there were four squads of four guards, and all of them couldn't produce an answer that was satisfactory to the anti-supernaturalist Herod, and so looking for a natural reason, he put them to death. You know, tyrannical leaders, those who, who, who have no regard for God, also will have no regard for human life. And we see that here in Herod. And what the result of all this is, is pandemonium, baby. Pandemonium breaks loose in the early church because of what Herod's doing. You know, pandemonium is extreme confusion, extreme disorder. And often, it's born of fear. We had pandemonium. This was a big deal. You know, the writer says it this way. The writer, Luke, says, there was no small commotion. That is his understated way as saying it was a huge deal. There's pandemonium that broke loose. You know, I think today there's plenty of pandemonium, isn't there? I mean, you don't have to wait till 2024 to get the sense of pandemonium in our culture. Our culture loves to spin in this cycle of extreme, you know, confusion and disorder. The, the, the news, the media relies upon this. The politics feeds it. It's a constant, you know, source and, and, and sense of a panic in our culture. There's confusion. There's disorder. There's fear. It's like, it's, like it's, it's fire and rain pouring down on our people all the time. You feel it. I feel it. We all feel it. 
And if you really get into it, it can have a crippling effect on your heart. You know, I mentioned fire and ring. Um, for those of a certain age, those words are familiar to you because there was a great song many years ago called Fire and Rain by James Taylor. I love that song. By the way, if you are like under the age of 25, you should absolutely stream that song. I'm going to look at this group right here. Go listen to Fire and Rain by James Taylor. Get educated on some real music people. Okay, this is really good stuff. Poetic, deep. Come on, maybe someone can remake it, right? You can put your beats into it and all that kind of stuff. But this is an incredible song, and, and James Taylor wrote this song, born of a, a painful period in his life. By the way, the song I got this is over 50 years old. That should make a lot of you feel really old, okay? <laughs> over 50 years old. So the song was written in a, in a time of pain for James Taylor. He wrote the song um, for a couple of reasons. One, he had a, a friend who tragically and suddenly passed away. That informed the songwriting. He also was going through uh, addiction. He was, he was stuck in addiction. And so out of his own depression and despair, he wrote this song. He says, I've seen fire and I've seen rain. I've seen sunny days that I thought would never end. I've seen lonely times when I couldn't find a friend. Fire and rain. And you know, again, in our culture, there's this constant sense of fire and rain. And here's, here's the question I would have for you. You know, it seems as if James Taylor, in that, turned and wrote a song that he said he didn't know where to send it to. Do you know where to send the feelings that you feel whenever fire and rain hit your life? And listen, if it's not the news for you, if it's not the political world, then maybe it's something personal. But whatever it is, whenever you're feeling the fire and rain in your life, where do you turn? Do you know where to send that to? Listen, the person who follows Jesus is to be different in their response to the fire and rain of our culture. That the person who's a Christian, the person who follows Jesus, responds in faith. There's a great quote by uh, Corey Ten Boom. And Corey Ten Boom said this. She said, there is no panic in heaven. God has no problems only plans. You get that? No panic in heaven, only planning in heaven. And so that should, with that knowledge, with that understanding, that should produce a, a sense of faith in us whenever we face the fire and rain of our culture. So these early followers of Jesus were facing fire and rain, right? And, and, and there's a response we see in them. It's kind of a motif within the book of Acts. Certainly in Acts chapter 12, there's a key verse. If you look at Acts chapter 12, verse 5, you'll see what I think is maybe the key verse of this chapter, or one of the key verses, and it's this. It says this. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. You see, the response of the follower of Jesus amid the fire and rain of our culture isn't panic, isn't freaking out, isn't necessarily anger all the time. No, it's one of prayer. That is to be the response of the Christian. What do we do with an election looming and all the craziness that's going to happen there? By the way, a year from now, you can, you can look forward to unending political ads on your television set. Isn't that a wonderful thought? What do you do with all that? We pray. We turn to Jesus. Someone said, we turn to Jesus preaching, girl. They're preaching from the pews today. I love it. Yeah, you know, um, listen, these early followers of Jesus had no political clout, none. They had no friends to pull strings for them, nobody. You know what they did? They appealed to a higher throne. They appealed to the throne of grace. They understood that God alone could solve their problems, so Peter is arrested unfairly. He's being sentenced to death. Their thing is, we're going to pray. We're going to pray like crazy. That, that is the response of the Christian. And, and, and I want to ask you this question. Are you praying? Are you praying? And, and I, would, I would encourage you to really wrestle with that. Because I would suggest that each one of us 
including the pastors in this room, including the people who have been following Jesus for a long time, that each of us has room to up our prayer game. All of us do. How, how often we pray, we should, we should pray more. we got to pray more. Because that is our hope. That is our strength. You know, um, prayer, I, I know this from personal experience over the course of now many years. It's something that feels like it's a contested time. Things distract me. I don't want to do it. You know why? There's a spiritual battle that is raging that wants to pull you away from turning to the throne of grace, to turning to the one who could solve your problems. And so listen, are you praying? You know, before you, listen, before you throw up your arms in despair, before you complain, before you make another Facebook post about something as a rant, you know who you are. Turn to the Lord and pray. Are you praying first and foremost? That James Taylor song, Fire and Rain, it's, it's one of my top ten favorite songs. And, and the reason I love it so much is that in the second verse, there is this beautiful, wonderful prayer that he sings. If you know the song, you, you know the verse. He says, won't you look down upon me, Jesus? You got to help me make a stand. Just got to see me through another day. My body's aching and my time is at hand. I won't make it any other way. I love that line. I won't make it any other way. And listen, you and I, we won't make it any other way either. It's only through the power of prayer. And so I call on you, be a people of prayer. If you struggle with this, like I do at times, listen, there's an app that we've put out there before. I'll put it out there again. You can use it. It's almost like a, a digital prayer journal for you. You can do it on your iPad or your, your phone. It's called the Echo Prayer app. And what I do is like when someone asks me to pray for something, someone, I, I put it in my app. I can actually even check it off when I get a report that like God's answered the prayer. You can do that. It's, it's a wonderful. You can pray for the church. You should look this up, and you could follow Christ Church or Grow Farm. It's a wonderful way to encourage prayer in your life. It'll remind you to pray. It'll give you like a log of how, how, how long you're praying. That's kind of intimidating, right? Listen, there, there's this thought, and the thought is this. Keep your chin up and keep your knees down because you're on victory side. The early church faced pandemonium, and their response was another P, and that was prayer. So pandemonium strikes. Let's look at the rest of this story now, picking back up in the second half of verse 19. So Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They had now joined together and sought an audience with him. And after securing the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. So we're looking at the power now. We looked at the, the pandemonium. Now we're going to look at the power. And what you're getting a whiff of here, whether you realize it or not, is the angry of a wicked ruler. Herod was a wicked ruler. And it says here, this is interesting. They're very nice how they put this. It says he had been quarreling with the people. They had a quarrel, right? Listen, the original language indicates that it's not just some sort of tiff they had. What it indicates, when you look at it, is that as if Herod was carrying on war with this people with great animosity. And it's written in a tense that suggests that this was a character trait of Herod. He had animosity towards all people. He was a warmonger. And so what he was doing was what, what he always did. Herod's doing what Herod do. And Herod was a wicked man who was always seeking to act with evil intent towards the people. And now his, his wrath seems to be going towards the people of Tyre and Sidon. What you see here is another motif. If prayer is one motif of the book of Acts and Acts 12, another here is power. Power is at stake here. And, and the power of Herod is being exacted 
first of all, over individual believers. I mean, if you go back to the beginning of the book, what do we see? That the church is suffering. James has been killed once again. Peter has been put in prison. And, and, and the church today suffers still because of wicked leaders like Harry. Maybe we feel this in the United States, maybe we don't, but I'll tell you this, there are believers in other parts of the world who feel the oppression, who are suffering under wicked leaders, who are seeking to silence the voice of the church. In fact, God's people have always suffered. This is nothing new. What we're reading here about Herod, who wanted to take out the church, who wanted to suppress the church, this has always been the story for believers. It's constantly been the story. But you know what else has been a constant? That God has preserved, he's preserved a witness through the church throughout all times. Another thing we see with the power here in this passage is the power of Herod over nation states. This was a wicked leader. And the people of Tyre and Sidon depended upon the land, the people that Herod had ruler, uh, leadership over. Uh, they produced corn, Galilean corn. And their corn was used to feed the countries of Tyre and Sidon, kind of like Iowa feeds California, supplies them with corn. That's, that's the kind of thing that was happening here. This is all very political in nature. And, and because somehow Tyre and Sidon had displeased Herod, they were in danger of losing their, their food line, their assistance. And so what did they do? They bribed Blastus, who was thought to be the chamberlain for, for, for Herod. And, and he agreed to meet, Herod did, with delegates from Tyre and Sidon at this festival that was taking place in Caesarea. And when he met with them, here's what he did. He showed off. He flaunted his authority and his glory. And the people of Tyre and Sidon we're quick to flatter him. You know what this all is? It's a vain game. That's what it is. No different today, is it? This whole political scene is all about someone feeding their own ego, greasing their own palm. It's a vain game. And that's what was taking place right here. You know, at the same time, though, while there's the power of Herod, there's also, and we get a glimpse of it as we go on in the chapter, the power of God on display. Don't miss this. Because the power of God is really the point of the story. You know, through an act of power, God intervenes and delivers Peter and then the church for his own glory. For his own glory. So that his name would be exalted and not the name of Herod. You know, um, back to my song. Fire and Rain, James Taylor. In 2001, in the aftermath of 9-11, there were, there were several uh, gatherings that took place to raise support for the families who had been affected by the tragedy. Um, and so one of those was a benefit concert. And who showed up to play at that benefit concert? But James Taylor. And one of the songs that James Taylor sang at that benefit concert was Fire and Rain. Now, it's interesting. You know, Fire and Rain, I told you, is about this you know, time in his life where he was depressed. He had, he had lost a friend. He was stuck in just despair you know, over his own depression, his own brokenness. And he writes in that song, in the third verse, he says, something about flying machines and pieces on the ground. Now, James Taylor, by his own admission, says that this was a song that, that felt like it wrote itself. He sat down at the time in 1969 and penned this song. And it's as if it came from an outside source, is what he says. And here he was, 30-some years later, standing in front of a group of people who had seen with their own eyes fire and rain on their city, flying machines and pieces on the ground. And as he had the opportunity to select songs, he selected one that had a prayer in it. A prayer that says, won't you look down upon me, Jesus? you got to help me make a stand got to see me through another day. I won't make it any other way. You know what that is? That's God seeking his own glory amid a people. And he'll use anyone for it. He can use Peter. He can use Herod if he wants to. 
He can use James Taylor. He can use whoever he wants. But here's what he will do. He will seek his glory amid a people. And here's what he did. He comforted that people with his power over death and destruction and evil intents of men. He comforted them even through a pop song. I love it. Listen, this display of total power, the complete and total power of God, should encourage you today. It's not just for the people of this day that we're reading about in the first century. It's not just for the people of of 9-11. It's for us today. We should be encouraged. Listen, Herod falls. The word of God continues to gain momentum. And and it's spurred on. And it, it succeeds and it flourishes. God is continuing his goal of building the kingdom of God. And he uses people to do that. We see this represented here. That story that we see unfolding in Acts 12 is still pertinent today, and it's for you. Yeah, you look at 2024, you look at your circumstances today, whatever it is, you can have a rock-solid trust that the work of God, the power of God, is fully trustworthy. Don't be discouraged. You know, if there are any obstacles that need to be removed, you're going to see in a moment. God will remove those obstacles because his kingdom will not fail. Let's read about an obstacle and how it's reviewed, uh, re, re, um, sorry, uh, removed. Verse 21. On the appointed day, the day of this festival, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on the throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, This is the voice of a God, not of a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down. And he was eaten by worms. And he died. You know, um, the thing I want to say about this, we're looking at the pain now. We've seen the pandemonium. We've seen the power. Now we're seeing the pain. And, And let me tell you this, plain and simple. If you oppose Jesus, you lose. That's not just for Herod. Like, if, 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 if any of us would dare oppose Christ, that's a losing proposition. You know, this account that we're reading about the death of Herod, we actually have other sources that verify the way this happened. There was a first century historian named Josephus. And Josephus wrote an independent account of the Bible that is almost like exactly, with a few other details included, that which we read in the Bible. And here's what we know. Herod went to a festival in Caesarea. On that day, he wore, as the Bible says, some grand clothing. He was showing off. He was flaunting. And it said that his, his robe was this brilliant, like, silver garment. And when the sun hit it, it sparkled. And it drew the people's attention. And in that day, that was such a lavish thing that the people were drawn in by it. And of course, what do they do? Well, they, they are impressed by Herod. And so they, they played on his ego and they said, you're like a god. And he ate all this up. Herod loved this. He loved this kind of thing, every minute of it. And he didn't give glory to God. And so what happened, and Josephus writes about this too, he was seized with great pain and he died. Josephus tells us that it happened five days later. And the worms thing, it, it could have been that he had appendicitis. It could have been that he had some kind of intestinal worm, which was very common in those days. No matter what, here's what you can bet. He went through incredible pain. The way that he died was painful. And I don't think the Bible's gloating over this. But here's what it's showing us. That the painful death wasn't necessarily what, what killed him, the, the worms. What killed Herod was desire to take the place of God in his life and in this world. And I got to tell you, that's 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 a crazy thing to think about. And maybe we would never say that, but we have to check our own behavior because some of us, myself included sometimes, want to rule our own lives. We want to take the place of God and say, I can do what I want to do. I'm going to do me. I don't need someone to to guide me, direct me. I'm going to live my life. 
That's what Herod was seeking to do. He wanted, he wanted to live his life. He wanted the glory. And that ended up in a painful place for him. You know, all of this, the, the death of King Herod, points us to the gospel. Because there is a future man of sin, man of, of lawlessness, as the Bible refers to him, that's going to emerge. You know, when you think about the political scene, here's what we can tell you. And the Bible is true, and it's been proven over time to be right. And what we know is this. There is going to be probably a political leader who arises who is called a man of sin or a man of, of lawlessness. In fact, if you look at 2 Thessalonians, just further on in the New Testament, chapter 2, we, we read about this person. Listen. The, the scripture says, don't let anyone deceive you in any way for that day, the day of the Lord, when Jesus returns to make all the wrongs right and deliver his people, that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. We read about this in Revelation 13. There will be one who exalts himself like Herod did as God. And just as God took out Herod, he will take out this one as well. There's a hope for this world. There's a hope for you. That the same God who delivered the early church from the hand of evil Herod will deliver you. Th this same God will deliver his people from the man of lawlessness. That will happen. You can bet on it. Take it to the bank. This same God will deliver you from your own sin, from your own brokenness. He sent his son Jesus to pay a price for us so that we might be ransomed, delivered from the captivity of evil and the powers and principalities of this world. Will you turn to Jesus? Don't try to rule your own life. Don't try to place the, 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 take the rule on of God in your life. He will deliver you day by day. And in the end, there will be a great deliverance that you're a part of if you will trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and his salvation. God delivers. God delivers us. You know, there's that J James Taylor, fire and rain. I won't make it any other way. And I can tell you this, you and I will not be delivered in any other way than by the power of Jesus Christ. We see it here with Herod, and we will see it in our lives as well. All for the glory of God. So listen, you know, I said this, I said if you, you, you oppose Jesus, you lose. Well, if you stick with Jesus, you win. Really plain and simple. Stick with Jesus, and you will win. Be faithful. Don't let go. Continue to follow him. Continue to trust him. There is a comfort through the pain. You can be bold. You can be courageous to share the word of God, to share the gospel. Because there's a world who needs to hear it, that there's a deliverer. That there is one who will make all the rights wrong. So spread the word of the gospel. And leave the outcome of all the stuff that's happening in this world to the power of God through Jesus Christ. There is pandemonium that, that comes about. There are powers that are at play. And there is pain in this life, but there's hope through that pain through Jesus. Look at one last verse with me. Verse 24 says this. I love this summation. This is really the summation of all of chapter 12, all that's taken place. It says this, but the word of God, but, but, but the word of God continued to spread and flourish. You know, I was thinking about the, the P words, right? Pandemonium and power and pain. And there's some more P words we could apply to this. Perpetual, persistent, persevering, permanent. Because the kingdom of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ is persistent. It is, it is persevering. It is perpetual. It is permanent. It's not going anywhere despite the pandemonium of this world and the powers that are at play. It will not be 
thwart it. It will keep on going. The church continued to grow and to multiply. I mean, think of chapter 12. Chapter 12 of Acts opens up with James being murdered, with Peter being in prison, and what seems like Herod being triumphant. That's how chapter 12 opens. But by the end of chapter 12, what do we see? It's all flipped. Herod is now dead. He's been killed. Peter's been set free. And what's happening in verse 24? The gospel of Jesus is triumphant. There you have a little microcosm of human history. And that's what you can put your money on, so to speak. That's what you could take home with you. That's what you could build your life on is the hope that God will be persistent. He will be pursuant. He will persevere. His purposes will not be thwarted. His kingdom is permanent. It's here to stay. It's not going anywhere. And don't be impressed by temporary worldly triumphs over the gospel because they are just that. They are temporary. The kingdom of God is lasting. You know, there'll be unrighteous rulers like Herod that emerge. It's happened throughout history. And they cannot stop the progress of the kingdom of God, of the gospel. You could kill James. You could put Peter in prison. But the power of the, of the state or some politician is impotent to stop the gospel. I want to tell you one more time. Nothing, listen to me, nothing can stop the gospel. In this world, in your life, give glory to God. Because nothing can stop the gospel. This is, this is a good message for, for, for dark times. It's hope in the midst of darkness. Maybe we tuck this away for what's ahead. Because we can put our faith and our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, big letters on the screen. Nothing can stop the gospel. It's that important. It's a message of all the book of Acts. It's a message of chapter 12. It's a message for us today. I want to call you to do what the early church did. And that's to pray. What do we do in, in light of all of this? Well, let's cry out in our hearts. Not just with words, although it'll be stressed in words, but with our hearts and faith and trust of our great God. Let's turn to him in prayer now. Oh, Father in heaven, we thank you for your word we thank you for this great truth, which is indeed hope in a dark time. Lord, this world has endured dark times for, for generations, for centuries. And just as the church endured a dark time when Herod was seeking to take them out, and they saw the kingdom of God persevere, we put our trust in you, Father. Father. That just as you delivered them, you will also deliver your people today and in the years to come. That we don't have to give in to the pandemonium of the world and be freaked out. And we could trust in you. And so even now, God, as we think about the pandemonium of our lives, the pandemonium of our culture, the powers that are pl at play, we turn to you. And we say, God, we trust you. We trust in the persevering nature of your kingdom. We know that nothing can stop you. We appeal, God, to your throne and know that you alone can solve all of our problems and all the problems of the world. God, direct us, lead us. God, there's a lot of pain in the world, there's pain in our own nation. There's pain in our individual lives. And that pain is hard to explain. But God, I know there's a comfort through the pain in Jesus. And so God, as we consider your deliverance, your, your, your power over all the earth, we know it's over our own lives even. And so we turn to you today with whatever pain we're facing or the pain that we bear for, for our nation and we say, God, we trust you. 
We remember, God, that you are our deliverer. That if we stick with you, we'll win. That we keep our chin up. Keep our knees down because we're on victory's side. Thank you, God, that that victory comes through Jesus on the cross. If there's anyone, Lord, who has been seeking to be their own God, to have control over their own life, I pray, God, that they would let that go. They wouldn't take the place of you, but rather they would give you your rightful place in their lives. Simply by saying, I believe in Jesus. He is the Son of God. He died for my sins. He rose again. And He delivered us all. He will deliver us all. Oh God, I pray that we would see the church grow and be multiplied. I pray, God, we wouldn't be impressed by temporary worldly triumphs, but that we would trust you knowing that nothing can stop the gospel in this world and in our lives. Have your way, Lord Jesus. All this we pray in his name. Amen. We're going to end this service a little differently. Typically the band would come out and we'd sing a song. Today I'm going to dismiss you. And as we do, I actually want to go back to the song we sang earlier. All hail King Jesus. That song really gripped me as I was thinking about this passage. It's a song fit for a king, the ruler of the world. And so team in the back, if you can have those, that, that chorus ready, we're going to sing this as a, as a way of finishing. Would you all stand, please? We're going to sing All Hail King Jesus. This is the chorus, is what I want to sing. I ask you to lift your voice with me, and let's sing this once more as a response of faith. For all that's happening in this world, we trust the King, Jesus Christ. All Hail King Jesus. All hail the Lord of heaven and earth. All hail King Jesus. All hail the Savior of the world. One more time. All hail King Jesus. See in faith. All hail the Lord of heaven and earth. All hail King Jesus, all hail the Savior of the world. Amen. Lord Jesus, you are our Savior, and so we cry out to you. God, there's pandemonium in this world. It can get us down, but I pray, God, that we would remember there is power and that he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. I pray, God, we wouldn't be discouraged that we wouldn't allow the pain of this life to turn us away, but that we would trust in you. So go, in the name of Jesus, the Savior of the world, hail him with your life, tell someone about him, and go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All this we pray in Jesus' name.